We're just trying to breathe while black in America. Y'all laughing already. All right, so y'all can just blurt out the answers to these as you wish. Michael Jackson or Prince? Michael, Michael Jackson. Michael, Michael Jackson. Jackson. That sounds so unanimous. Wait, hold on, my man. Mm. Here you go. Yeah. Yeah. Shirt, he for purple okay. Rain. Purple rain. He has so a thing with that. Yeah. <laughs> growing up, like the younger me, um, I should be careful on face, but growing up. <laughs> Michael Jackson for sure, but as I got older, <laughs> Prince is the man for me. Like oh, wow. I, I rock with Prince. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Question. That's kind of weird. Like I, I rock with both, but I, I'm gonna stand out and say Prince. Don't don't sleep on him. And I know y'all not, but <laughs> Prince. Okay, another comparison: Michael Jordan or LeBron James? LeBron. Jordan. Mm. LeBron. 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 Oh, that's. I mean, LeBron. Jordan. Jordan man. <laughs> yeah, Jordan all day. Jordan. LeBron. Jordan. Jordan. Okay, so. Inside the game of basketball, I'm going to go Jordan. Mm -hmm. Went to the final six times, got all six rings, never lost. Took two years off to play baseball, came back, and was still winning rings. Never needed a game seven. It was like if he was in the finals, it was over. Mm. So in basketball, I'm going to give it to Jordan. But life outside of basketball, yeah. absolutely giving it to LeBron. Yeah, mm -hmm. for Building sure. Building the school, helping the kids. Yeah. 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 Black Lives Matter. Same wife. Okay. Same. All that. Still, still yeah. LeBron, though. Still <laughs> okay. He like, let's go. Okay, so vacation. Sorry. Mountains or beach? Beach. 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 We got some beach, beach folks. Beach for sure. I'm mountains all day. Beach. Yes, it I'll is. Get me lost on a good hike. Spencer knows yes, who's out yeah. there in Utah. And I, we I can go to the beach. Good, I love a good hike on mountains too, but yeah, beach. Cause she likes the beach, so I'm like, well, I'm gonna be where you at, babe. So, beach. Okay. Um, now we're gonna just take a moment just to breathe. And, uh, I know that for some people, breath work is like, what is this? This is weird. Is this yoga? What is this? I'll say that for me, it has no spiritual implications at all. For me, my spiritual <laughs> underpinnings, real simple, is Jesus, you know? Um, but mentally, it helps you let go of stress. Emotionally, it helps you to unwind, separate from your day, any traffic, any stress, any busyness you had in your day. I know my man Nick was saying today was a killer busy day for him. I know for me and Bird both, today was chaos. So this is a way that we move away from distraction and just get fully present right here and be all in for this moment. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big phrases that we heard a lot, that we saw a lot, that's championed on people's masks a lot is I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. And it's for a reason, because there were individuals that were pleading and saying, please, sir, I can't breathe. And so we're gonna have this moment of breath, if for no other reason, in celebration of the fact that we can breathe and in honor of those who tragically can no longer breathe. Mm. We're gonna take 30 seconds of silence. Mm. This is not a lead breath work exercise. This is you just simply closed eyes, open eyes, sitting, standing, however you wanna be. Just having a solemn moment of breath. 30 seconds begins now. About 10 more seconds. And any cadence of breath is welcome as long as it's not a rushed or forced or hectic breath. All 
by in your own timing on your next exhale, you can go ahead and come on back. Does anybody feel worse now than they felt before the breathing? Mm -hmm. no. Funny how that happens. Mm -hmm. Funny how that happens. Remember that, take that with you into your most hectic days. Our sympathetic nervous system sends us into fight or flight. Time to freak out about everything, right? right? As if things were life or death. Our parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest. Okay. Wait, hold on one second. They said that, that ticked me off. I want to slap the taste out their mouth, but I'm gonna actually process it for a minute right. and then be able to choose a response. So what's one thing you've accomplished in your life that you're the most proud of? Terry, I'll jump in there. Yeah. For me, and, and I say this with 100% honesty, it's, it's getting married. I've dated my wife for 10 years before we got married. So wow. marriage was like frightening to me, mm -hmm. you know? You bring it up and I'm like, oh, here we go again, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but so to, to make that step and then do it 100% and be all in, mm -hmm. you know? And, and really be able to talk to my wife and, and her, her really say like, man, I'm like, we have a good marriage. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's, that's huge. Mine might be silly but it's um, graduating as valedictorian of my senior class in high school. Nice. And it wasn't just because of the title. It's because I, when I look back, it's the first thing that I really set, my set myself to do. First big goal I ever really had started in ninth grade when I learned of what a valedictorian was. And every year my goal was to be top student so that by the time senior year came, I'd be valedictorian. Man, I guess I would say for me, and I was, I was gonna say the answer, you know, marrying my wife and getting married. I definitely top on the list. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, okay. but um, <laughs> even when you look at that, right? Like yeah. even going to the root of me marrying my wife, it was because I made the decision to follow Christ mm -hmm. for me. So while I was on her, on my own path, she of course was on her own path, but because I was following Christ and walking my purpose, the only reason she reconnected with me is because I was walking in the purpose that he had for me, mm -hmm. right? So I made that decision and because I made my yes to him, long story short, short she said yes to me, mm -hmm. to me right? So that was definitely number one on my list is when I made that decision to follow him, everything else just opened up to where it led me to the second greatest decision <laughs> thing I've <laughs> in relation to what I do um, I think I'm realizing even with thinking about this is just how I've been able to inspire the next generation and that's very humbling to me just because of where I'm from and um, you know so to get little kids like my niece and my nephews that you know ask about my day to day and auntie where are you traveling next and just how God has taken me all over the world to do what he's called me to do um, it's, you know, it's not just about me. And I've known that for a while, but I never knew exactly why. You know, like, why me, God? Like, why did you put me in this place? Like, why not someone else, you know, who was smarter, who had more money, who had more influence? And just as I'm talking about this, like, he's telling me, like, no, I want to use you mm -hmm. to inspire the next generation. So, yeah. for sure. I would say to that. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's awesome. I love how you got a little emotional too. Like yes, this, yeah. Like you, mm. it, 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 <laughs> We're never gonna get it right. your heart, you know. Yeah. And I want to just acknowledge this too, because you said, you know what? I don't know how to say it without speaking to what I do, but I want to just remind you that that's not about the job; it's about the journey. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You said coming from where that's I'm good. from. Yeah. You from Oak Cliff, Texas. I am. <laughs> Oak Cliff. Yes. Yes. It is. You know what I'm saying? Like. And I say this respectfully only as it's reflective of your story, but you came from the bottom and you're at the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have a doctorate degree out of Oak Cliff. You're the yeah. rose that grew from the concrete. And that's amazing. I'm proud of you too and grateful for you. Thank you. As a parent of young kids, I'm like, yeah, the next generation, like when it's time to pick role models, I hope that they have a Christiana in their sights. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Terry. Uh, I'll honor <laughs> you for that, no that's doubt. Awesome. Awesome. I would say uh, my greatest achievement was getting a scholarship to go to college. You know, and I got that through sports, obviously. Um, but I have a single mom and growing up, coming from Rochester, New York, you know, the, the odds, the st statistics of you going to school on a free ride is 
slim to none, mm-hmm. you know. And my mom always told me, I, I can remember since the first grade, you know, when I would bring my report card home um, at the end of the week and I wouldn't have good grades, you know, she said, you can play all the sports you want, but I tell you this, like, if you don't stay committed to school and uh, resp- be respectful to your teachers and honor that part of your life, you're not going to be successful. Uh, being able to go to school on a full ride was was something that it made my mom happy. You mm. know, it, it wasn't so much about me, but it was, you know, I, she didn't have the money to send me to school. So I, when I got that scholarship, uh, I left. You know, I left home at 18. I haven't been back. You know, and I've, I now have three degrees. You know, and wow. um, just making her happy and knowing that her son is, you know has been committed to uh, what she's taught me has, has been something that uh, I'm probably proud of, but she's more proud of. Mm. Yeah, so. Mine, I would say, um, was having my daughter. I was a teenage mother and, um, you know, I was supposed to go off to school for um, track scholarship and everyone told me to have an abortion and I did um, consider it. And I remember I was on the bus stop and I told God I didn't want to. And I was like, if you just help me do this by my, you know, just help me, just show me what to do. I'll um, honor that. And that changed the trajectory of my life, but it also made me who I am today when yeah. people tell me no wow. and not to do something or to go along with what they think is the best thing for me. I just remember what I did it for, you know, Mm -hmm. and who I'm doing it for. And um, doing that, I've watched her grow up into a woman that I'm proud of and been able to be her rock and give her the uh, self-esteem to make decisions based on what's best for her versus what everyone else wants. Wow. So, yeah. So good. That's empowering. It's amazing. Yeah. That's beautiful. It's on me now. <laughs> I'm gonna say this first. I'm cold. I'm over here shivering. <laughs> <laughs> the whole time. But uh, obviously, number one will be giving my life to Christ. It'll be four years this past January. Awesome. Um, awesome. But you know, I'm gonna I'm 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 say my scholarship second, and that's what I kind of want to speak on: uh, getting a scholarship to a school that I dreamed of going to. Um, Man, I remember sitting down with my mom when I was in elementary school watching Vince Young play. And I just taught her, I said, that's where I want to go to school. I want to go to college at the University of Texas. And to see that come full circle and just to see how God worked in the intricacies of that. And something that seemed so distant in my life, to be able to achieve that, it it just kind of showed me like, you know, when when you're for God, when you're humble, so many things are possible. Mm -hmm. And it it gave me a sense of, of, of pride, of direction, and of, of humbleness to be able to walk and say, I've, ach- I've achieved something and I had a great support system to make it happen, but uh, this is the tip of the iceberg and there's so much more out there. Yeah. So that young high school, middle school kid who was just wondering how to navigate and make it happen, not really having peers who had done anything like that before, any family members to achieve something like that, and just to see God work in it. Uh, that was a huge moment for me and that's something I'll always be grateful for. And despite the way that it may have played out in college, uh, it goes back to what Levada said. You know, what God has for you is always meant for you. And that trajectory has allowed me to be in this room right now talking to you guys. So mm-hmm. I'm definitely thankful for that. And uh, yeah, so that'd be it. Wow, that's awesome. It's awesome, man. Mm-hmm. So dope. In the last 365 days, mm. particularly <laughs> challenging to think about highlights in this past year, given what this past year has been. Yeah. In the last 365 days, <clears throat> what was your biggest highlight, mountaintop moment? What was that for you? As you guys know, the NBA shut down last year. <coughs> so we went to the bubble oh, <laughs> in Florida. So that, that, that was a highlight for, for several reasons. Um, one, it's the first time that's ever been done. So you create history. Um, and then also, like, being down there, I was so appreciative of the moment of what we were going through with the social injustices and being with you know, a group of men who had to sacrifice, you know, and leave their families 
to go play a sport, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, guys had different reasonings behind why they chose to go play, but the conversations that I had with those guys, it made me realize that a lot of them chose to go down there because they wanted to represent for uh, our community, mm -hmm. right? They, mm -hmm. they wanted to uh, honor who we are as a people and, you know, inspire the kids and, and give people hope through their entertainment, right? And a lot of the conversations also entailed with those players, the things that are going on in this world have to be addressed. And I think sometimes as you going through, you know, professional sport, it's very transient, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's go, go, go. You're in a new city, you're playing a game and people look and they see you on TV and these guys make a lot of money and they don't realize these guys are people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're humans, right. right? And they have emotions. So, you know, I remember one of the guys broke down and, and cried to me. You know, we were talking about the George Floyd thing mm -hmm. and we're all out at the pool and we're just sitting there. You can't do anything. You're, you're playing this sport, but everybody else is on the outside, just unrest in, yeah. in America, yeah. you know, and there were so many powerful moments that happened in conversations. And it wasn't just on our team, but we had groups of teams there. So there was bonding across the league with these men who have really they're, they're on a high platform. Yeah. And they influence their community. So it was good to be a part of that and to uh, be a source of stability and strength and, and to listen to them during that time. Mm -hmm. So that was definitely a highlight and that I would cherish that for the rest of my life. You know, a lot of the dialogue that was going on during that time. So for you, all of a sudden, it became less about competition and more about conversation. Yes, yeah, great way to put it. Yeah. Meaningful connection that was revealing purpose, yeah. motive platform being used in a way that was constructive. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I just want to speak to what he just said and what you just said about that connection that we all, some were forced to have and some people organically had with their family or friends or whoever, because you didn't have as much access to your loved ones as you would have wanted to if you were responsible. And one thing that I uh, cherished from the last 365 days is just my whole big old family getting on a Zoom at least once a month and talking to each other. You know, something that we would wait five, 10 years for a family reunion to do. So um, even to this day, it's it started something in just us connecting with each other. My family in Seattle, a family in California and New York and like all these different places of people I just don't talk to on a regular that I, I see their faces, I see their kids, you know, we check in with each other. And it's really like, a really deep connection that we've all formed with each other because of the pandemic. So um, I love that and I don't take that for granted, mm. for sure. Mm, it's good. Yeah. yeah, and just kind of to piggyback on that, like the support of family yeah. and the, the limited support that you can receive, at least how we were used to getting it uh, pre-COVID. But my mountaintop moment, or just my mountain climb to the mountaintop moment was last year. I actually got COVID. And uh, so I had it and I, you know, had to do the quarantine and all that. And uh, this is when I was just hunkered down in my room in, in the guest bedroom. Uh, during that time, uh, I needed support, right? Because uh, I was in that room, but my wife, she was out in the other room and she was always checking on me. And um, she took it to like a whole nother level because I couldn't smell or taste. Like those, those are the symptoms that I had. Of course, she started like doing all kind of research, like yeah. make my food extra hot. And then she would like uh, give me lavender oils and say, put this under your nose, see if you can smell it. Like she was yeah. just checking on me at every second. Yeah. And then like on the other side of the door, we would, you know, pray for each other. And she'd always say, babe, are you all right? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'm Netflix binging. We good. I'm, <laughs> look, I'm straight. But and, like she was just constantly there looking out for me every step of the way. And uh, it was the moment when I could finally taste. I was like, I ate something. I was like, okay, I could taste that. And she just broke down crying. She was like, oh, and it's <laughs> crazy. Your moment. And I was like, wow. Yeah, like, wow. it was so big. But in that moment, I was like, wow, uh, like, yeah. you really here. Yeah. And like, you you care for me so much. <laughs> like, like, I got it, because I didn't, I mean, I was like, cool, I'm good, but like, just seeing, the support and seeing how hard she wanted to make sure that her husband was good was just an amazing feeling to know that, you know, in this journey, even if it's just me and you, I know that I'm good. 
right? And and I just want you to know that you're good at all times as well. But I really felt it at that point. Yeah. So when I'm at the mountaintop, I know it's not just going to be me. It's going to be me and her mm. at the end of the day. Mm. And that was just a beautiful feeling. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that was that was a moment where I was like, yes, it, it's it's us against the world. If it has to be like that, I know you're rocking with me. That's huge. That's yeah. I think speaking to connection, um, I have kind of a different angle. My mountain top moment was not when I found out I was pregnant, <laughs> but when I connected finally with baby girl. Mm -hmm. And that was a process for me, I guess, that I wasn't ready for. We weren't blocking anything, trying to be TMI, you know, but we were also not planning to get pregnant right, right then. We didn't think it was gonna be that quick, very quick. And so I think in that moment, there was a lot, you know, going on that season of our life. I remember September 23rd, the day I found out, I had stayed up all night working on a big project. I literally found out like at like 5 a.m. before I went to bed. Um, and it was a lot to process, not just the sudden, you know, okay, I'm pregnant, but also, you know, um, what it all meant and in, in, in like the trauma that I had kind of been been battling through the whole summer and, and knowing what that could mean for the baby and the pregnancy. So that was scary. And then I found out it's a girl, which is new. I have two boys, so mm. like, I ate it as my hair, but I'm like, Lord, the hair, I don't know what to do. <laughs> the boys, we could just cut it with a girl. It's like a whole thing, like black hair for a girl. And, yes. um, it was it was a lot, and I remember telling my mom and Terry like I feel like I haven't even connected with with her at all, and it had been months that I'd been pregnant, and so I don't know when the moment was, but I finally started to connect with her, and that's a special moment as a mom, you know, because you know feeling her and, and 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 really connecting on a deeper level. So that was my mountaintop moment. Now now we're cool, we cool baby girl, <laughs> hey. um, nice. but but that that process and that journey into this new um, was was kind of my mountaintop moment. Mm. I wish we had more representation on the things that y'all both just spoke to. Like, we were watching a superhero movie with our kids the other day. Like, they got one black couple on here and they're always fighting. Mm -hmm. We're hearing from a true and living, actual in-person couple, right? And my man is doing what most men don't do and being vulnerable and honest. And he's like, Man, she was just like there with me all in and she just really supported me. Like, if you got COVID, we got COVID. <laughs> in it for real. And uh, I wish that was better represented because I don't feel like we see enough of that. So thank you guys for sharing your story. For me, you know, I, I struggle with seeing this, this stigma of black fatherlessness and the caricature that's painted of it where it looks like it's far more pervasive than it is. I, as a black man, love my father, respect my father, so close to my father. It compels me to be a great father. And uh, I wish we had more representation on that too. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Absolutely. So shifting from highlights to hardship for you in the last 365 days, what would you say is your biggest hardship? I'll jump in. So one one of the things for me, even just <clears throat> in the work I do as a therapist, you, you know, I mean, by nature, I'm an optimist, right? I'm like, oh, man, you know, we can figure this out. But like COVID has created a different, different situation. You know, when you look at how it's affected us, um, the lives that have been lost, it, it's, it's been hard even for me <clears throat> on the other side of the table to offer that, that hope that I want people to kind of walk away with a sense of encouragement especially everything happening you know on the racial side like you, you know like I, I'm, I'm talking to people and I'm like I, I feel you like I, I feel it you know mm -hmm. and like walking away like, like I've just carried a lot of that mm -hmm. you know whereas before I think I've been able or, or better at kind of you know separating this from from real life but <laughs> it, it's not not so much now and and that's tough because if I live with it, I know they live with it, you know, and you, you try to do as much as you can. But sometimes you walk away, and you know, it's it's still there, yeah. you know, that heaviness, whatever it is that they may be going through, mm. you know, yeah. and, and I always feel that, you know, uh, being with y'all two mm. for the amount of time that we were together as I got ready for the season uh, this past year. 
I was cut twice. Mm -hmm. Now, if any of y'all ever see anything about my career, you'll see plenty of hardship, plenty of ups and downs. So I can't say that that's something new, but when we worked so hard, we were getting ready for it. And then I get go into training camp and I have an injury. I miss training camp. I get let go. Now that was, I think that was the first time I've been in the, I've been in the NFL for five years now. That was the first time that I, it, you, you felt it coming and you sit back and you like, yo, like mental health. Yeah. Mm. Like, how do I feel right now? Like, how do I process this emotion? Uh, how am I honest with myself? How do I, as a man, just feel it, be in that moment and not try to jump into the next thing to get my mind off of it. Yeah. And I just, I just sat down for a couple of days. Man, I just had to, I had to handle it alone. I couldn't go anywhere because of COVID. I couldn't see my family other than talking on the phone. And when you're in that state, you don't want to talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to you know, manage it on your own uh, to an extent. And to go from that to being able to finish the season the way that I did and to have the season that I had, that was a testament of working with you guys and saying, you know what, it's going to be a lot of things I can't control. Um, and like I said, y'all are a pillar of faith, of commitment, um, of hard work. So many, like I said, so many things I admire that when I was going through that, I said, let me just grind it up. Let me, let me process this emotion. Let me be as a man vulnerable. Let me talk to my family and then let me get back up and handle my business. And that's what I was able to do. I was able to finish the season strong. Wow. And because of that, man, I'm in a better position going into this off season. So uh, I look forward to when we can work and kick it again soon, <laughs> moving into the crib. So <laughs> I'm gonna be a little closer. I don't gotta stay with y'all. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> man, it's just so many things that I had to get over. Um, and I didn't realize it, but when I was with y'all, I was already learning how to equip myself for those situations. And then when they came, I was able to handle them the right way. So mm, appreciate good. that. Good. Good. Give it a little context under what he was saying. So he came and just stayed with us for like two months of last summer in preparation for the season. Um, and we always get to do work for conditioning in the off season leading up to the next year and everything. But it was kind of special this year. He was in the process of buying his home and just like, hey, camp out with y'all for a minute while I do it. And it became like a COVID safe household he could report in from and the whole deal. Um, so we were grinding, we're training. But we did so much more like just doing life together, cooking and having conversations. And uh, thank you for you know what you shared. That was very honoring you know, of me and Ash, but I wanna just throw some of the honor back at you. I noticed um, that you would keep a daily journal. And what I believe I saw was goals written out and there was a W or an L that had to be circled. You had to list like, based on what I set out to do today, what's today a win or a loss? Mm -hmm. And it speaks so much to your integrity, yeah. Yeah. your commitment, your willingness to accept accountability, and just your, uh, your relentless pursuit of purpose. Mm -hmm. Like it was bigger than football. It wasn't just the game, it was life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was I wake up at this time, I'm on my organic sea moss, I'm doing this and that. For real. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I wanna share mine kind of in the same fashion that, that Mojo did. My highlight and hardship, I think, are kind of connected. So we were contacted um, by a congressman about hosting George Floyd's family in the evening between his wake and his funeral. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, my father gave me the call and, you know, hey, here's the time we're showing up and here's what we're gonna do and that kind of deal. And it was basically for the purpose of being like a rest haven, a safe place for the family. Like there's no media, you can just eat. You can just grieve, cry if you need to cry. Like it's just, this is your time. And uh, seeing everything in that moment really felt like a highlight moment, like a mountaintop moment. Um, speaking humbly, not from a place of pride, not because, oh, we got to be a piece of a moment, but just the honor, um, the weight of that name, George Floyd, mm -hmm. what happened, the global outpouring of, like there was a movement, yeah. all 50 states involved. And I think it was like 58 other countries were involved. It, yeah. it was like the modern day civil rights movement. Right. And here we were finding ourselves like being stewards and shepherds of that movement for a moment and being able to um, let the aunties and the cousins and the daughters and the sons and the brothers and the sisters just, just come and have a safe space. Mm -hmm. And 
I felt grateful to be able to say to the news trucks, you can't come in here. I felt grateful to be able to see that family, those beautiful people, as much as they were hurting, coming into a place that's protected by law enforcement and how they're supposed to feel about law enforcement, given yeah. mm-hmm. what they've suffered. Right. And to see them just exude class and respect and dignity and to see them just sit and enjoy a good soul food meal. Yeah. And then the music begins to play. And then it's this odd notion of like, any funeral you've ever been to, you're hurting, and that's why you're there rallying, but then you're there, and oh, this is my cousin I haven't seen in two years. Yeah. Yeah. And you begin to see joy even in a place of pain. Yeah. And it's one thing to find gold, but it's another thing when you find gold in the garbage, now it's worth more to you. Like, I can't believe what I found in this place, you know? And that was absolutely a mountaintop moment and a highlight until it wasn't. And I think there's a lot of hardship connected to that same moment because later I would realize that um, I'm known for my smile, I'm known for carrying joy, and I think I'm relied on for that. And I think that I step into a room and joy is just kind of a thing, it's a side effect. You get Terry, you get in this smile. Hmm. And I hit a room with that and other people feel joy and I begin to see them mirror that smile And uh, all of a sudden, I didn't have access to that smile. I didn't have access to that joy. I suddenly lacked motivation for even the things that I love the most. And uh, I had to get real and realize that I had maybe taken in too much trauma for one brain to process. And I had to ask the real honest question, like, is this that I'm living in right now, is this a depressive episode? Like, there's no way, no way, not the D word, you know? And uh, that was my biggest hardship in the last 365. But what's crazy about the highlight to the hardship journey was like that hardship then ultimately led me to another mountaintop moment. And like a valley by definition is a low place between two high points. It's a low place between two peaks. And when we find ourselves in hardship, we can always look forward to that next peak, uh, that next highlight. And for me, it was, coming to a place of, like I celebrated my man, uh, Spencer, for being so vulnerable earlier. And uh, Marcus mentioned vulnerability too. For me, it was like a welcoming into a place of vulnerability. Like, yo, I'm actually stronger when I express that I feel weak. I just want to say as your wife, you know, I want to honor you and I'm proud of you for being so vulnerable and how you've carried that, how you've given me grace because my personality can be a lot. <laughs> and and he's, he's really given me grace to help as he's processed it too. So I'm with you. I love you. I'm with you too. But I will say this, like in the middle of a pandemic, there's a lot of people that suffered and had a lot of losses. You know, and the learning lesson for me losing my grandfather was, you know, give people their flowers while they while, while they still can smell them. Yeah. 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 And that's so important because sometimes we just live our lives and we don't think to make that phone call or send that text message just to let somebody know that, hey, I'm here for you. I love you. You know, how you doing? Just checking in. We don't do that to our family. You know, and, and, and that is so important, especially during a time like this, because people are checking out. Like, yeah. This is I know so many of my friends and I even have some other family members who have passed away from COVID. It's a real thing. Yeah. And when my grandfather passed away, I, I had to real like take a step back because death hit me personally. I was just like, whoa, like this is what other people have been really dealing with. Yeah. Right. I've been living my life working. And you know you see stuff on social media, and you're just going about your life. So the compassion isn't as present. It isn't as strong. But when it happens to you, you're like, oh wow, like I I feel this. You know, I feel what other people are going through. Like having this conversation in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. Like this is a beautiful thing. Like we're alive. We're breathing. Yeah. You know, we have our feelings, our consciousness, that that is something that's so powerful. Um, and to be present in that is is something that's important. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's good. Black and breathing, right? And even when we 
had our little breathing exercise earlier. Um, it's a it's a beautiful thing to be black and breathing. Yeah, I think the George Floyd incident mm. started the um, change for black people. For me, just the awakening of understanding our real deep purpose and seeing something that had been going on within our community, but done in such a way you could not ignore it anymore. Yeah. And um, I didn't watch what happened to him till after the funeral. I made sure to go, um, it was the middle of the pandemic, but I did go down to the protest they had here because I just felt like it was a moment in history that had been lived so many times before me, but I was in a moment of um, history in the making and a change. And I remember going and seeing so many people there and it was like attending a funeral, yeah. right? You go down there and it's solemn, we're meeting up with the family, meaning us. And then um, while we were walking, something in me just literally broke and I had to stand on the side of, of to keep myself up on the side of a building because I was just overcome with emotion. But even in that emotion, I saw um, the white people who had brought their kids out and were praying with us. I saw someone in the military with a sign that said, I didn't go fight for this country to watch my brothers and sisters die in this country. So in that moment, I realized we had a voice and we had, a, um, wow. we had allies. Yeah. So for me, it was like, you stop being quiet. Mm. You stop showing up to smile. Mm. You stop showing up to make everybody feel better and just return to be authentic and to really have discussions that could be painful for some to hear, but we had tolerated it for too long because as we're fighting the brutality over here, my man's over here trying to help some children become men and we're already having to fight a few other things so as i sat around listening to everybody it's amazing how as a culture in our deepest darkest moments we always see the light in the option of another valley it's like we never can stay in a place of depression or sadness because we have to see the purpose that came out of our pain yeah. or the bigger picture so um i think it's amazing that we're able to discuss our pain in these moments because it's been for so many generations. Mm. These conversations have been passed down. Our parents had them, our grandparents had them, you know, and we're just trying to breathe while black in America. What do you as a person of color in America feel that you need most right now? I just feel like <laughs> We just need a break. Mm -hmm. You know, I wow. don't want to have to continue to explain my humanity, mm. yeah. my position, mm. my feelings, mm. my. I don't want to entertain you anymore. I just wow. want a let me live. Mm. And by that, I also mean, you know, there's an issue. You are aware there's an issue. I need you to go fix it and just let me breathe. Mm -hmm. Just let me breathe because the people asking me the questions are the ones who actually need to come up with the solution. Mm. I just, you know, I just don't want to have to always be, on. be the black voice and break down why we feel like the way we feel and, right. and, and defend every single thing. So just to kind of piggyback off of what you said. Just the moment. Mm. Really, space. You got something you were going to share? Yeah, I mean, I, my answer is, is layered. Like, I think we need a lot of things. Um, I would start with respect. You know, and I think respect starts with understanding that we are div diverse people, right? We all come from different pockets of yes. communities and we're raised differently. Like I was raised around Hispanic people and black people, not a lot of white people, yeah. right? Down here in the South, there's pockets where I work with somebody, he said, I didn't see a black person until I was 21. Wow. I went off to school, right? So that's a real thing. Yeah. People are growing up and experiencing life in a different way, right? So their perception of what's right, what's wrong, how to treat people is gonna be different. Right. I think it starts with respect and understanding that we have different colors, shapes and sizes, but on the inside, we're all the same. I think sometimes we can walk around the streets and like we, 
like, dang, you didn't even see me. Or you see, like, I was running the other day and there was a, um, a white woman and she looked at me and she kind of like raised her eyes and then put them down real quick. And like, that hurt my feelings. I'm like, wow, like this is people's, yeah. like, this is crazy. Yeah. yeah. It is really crazy to me that like, either it's, it's fear, it's insecurity, but I think it just starts with the conversation. And, and just being open to surrounding yourself around people that look different than you yeah. and listening to them and uh, sharing your perspective and worldview and not being uh, feeling attacked when someone says something that you don't agree with. Yeah. yeah. You know, for, for me, I, I'll be honest with you, I've kind of, I've, I've been wrestling with this, right? Cause it's like, like what else has to happen for you to get it? Right. <laughs> you know, like this, this, this isn't, Unfortunately, this isn't new. Right. You know, so and even the question like, well, what do you need? You know, because it's like people are like, hey, what do you need? Like the same thing I needed 10 years ago, right. 20 years ago in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s. Like it's still happening. It just looks so for me, you know, I always wrestle with not becoming cynical. Right. You know, to be just completely transparent because I'm like, OK, you know, we're going to. And I think we've all probably wrestled with this, right? Like, okay, what, you know, and then we move on to something else, six months. And so for me, it's the, the biggest need is just the humanity of it. Yeah. Like put the race to the side, like this is a man, this is a father. Like if you can just try to connect with the humanity and that seems basic, but not, not always the case. Um, I, I think you can make a lot of inroads into some of the basic human problems that we're seeing, you know? Um, and then another thing too that I need is for us to continue to uplift black businesses. It's, it's been a huge, you know, you see like, hey, support black businesses. Or even on Uber, I saw like, hey, you know, and I'm like, it doesn't have to take George Floyd for us to realize that we got successful black entrepreneurs out here who are adding value to the community. And we need to support that unapologetically. 100%. Yeah. Mm, I agree with you with that. And I just think that people really have to go back and look at the history to learn why that's the case, why we need mm -hmm. you know, a helping hand, uh, even huge. more so than uh, maybe some other people do. To the uninformed mind, it's like, well, why are we supporting black owned business and not white owned business? Isn't that racist? Isn't right. that the right. opposite right. of equality? Right. But right. then you think about, and Martin Luther King said this in an interview, and it's a conversation that's coming back around today, but you see it as like big time buzzwords, like it's a new thing. Mm -hmm. But it's like, if the only people allowed to own land and hold commerce were white people, but then you had enslavement of black people, not that they were slaves, they were people abducted, stolen, commuted, and enslaved, mm -hmm. then there's literally a 400 year gap between you can achieve, you can earn, you can save, you can invest, you can leave inheritance for your kids, you, unpaid, but you'll work five times as hard. By the way, you're three fifths a person. You don't count as human. Right. So going from subhuman at a generationally disadvantaged state. Now here we are years and years and years later. And people wonder why, why are black people in the, in the hood in that part of town? Why do we have lower test scores? Why is there different differences in behavioral patterns and cognitive development? And it's literally humans who were told they were less than humans trying to operate in the world as human. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And then years later, when we tried to form those communities, those business communities, they were burned to the ground. Yeah. Literally. Right. literally. Right. Black yeah. Wall Street, Tulsa, black Oklahoma, Street. far before black Wall, Wall Street, Street, New York. I, as a black person, and unlike you, I grew up in a small Christian school, white, white all white people. It was like four black people in our high school uh, or in my class. And, uh, I never knew about the Tulsa or the or Black Wall Street until my friend Lanny Smith posted about it maybe a couple of years ago. And I just, I'm watching this like, what? How, like, how, people don't even know that there were these black communities, you know, thriving communities. We were crushing it. We were doing it. We were surviving on our own, making it for ourselves. And then it was burned to the ground. So when you talk about why we should support black businesses, there's a history, you know, there's, it's, a, it's a layered history. Um, one other thing I think, you know, what the black community needs, or I should say what white people can do blatantly <laughs> is 
I think either Aida or Terry said using your privilege to tear down walls of privilege or power. We applied for this grant and I'll leave the company nameless. Um, and it was it, it, the last question on the thing. I told Aida this <laughs> last question on the form was what can we do to support black owned businesses more, right? I went off that page to the company's website and I went to their team or their about page and I went to their, their team, <laughs> white male, white male, white male, white woman, white male. And then there was the one black person and can you guess what their, their role was? Diversity and inclusion. <laughs> so how about you start with putting people in power in your organization that will know, that will have a heart, that will have a lived experience that can speak to these communities, right? Start there, start with the leadership. Mm. And then we can start to really see some change. I got a lot of things that I feel. Uh, mental health, man. Yeah. Needing a counselor, need someone to confide in um, outside of family. Mm -hmm. uh, man, when you, as a black man, uh, being in Indianapolis this last three years, playing ball and having my apartment complex, I've had a number of situations where uh, one particular time, uh, me and one of my homeboys who had just came in for Ricky Minicamp and was working out for the team was coming over to my apartment complex and there was an older white lady walking in and it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's gated, everything needs a key fob to get in and mm -hmm. different layers of the, of the apartment complex and we were coming around from the outside. So I'm walking in, me and him are behind the two black athletes, mm -hmm. doesn't matter what we are, two black guys. Yeah. And uh, she hurries up, she, she gets her key fob, she opens the door and she comes around it and she says, do you live here? Hmm. And we say, yeah, we, I live here. So I go in, she says, well, y'all go, go on the elevator. I'll, get the, I'll catch it when it comes back. And it's like walking around in a hoodie, mm. uh -huh. seeing my, 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 my fellow black men and women uh, be attacked, yeah. uh, be victimized. And to feel like when I'm in that situation that I need to make other people around me feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I need to uh, yeah. just kind of die down my personality, who I am, what I want to do so that the people around me can feel safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize the microaggressions and mm -hmm. especially for black women, how hard y'all have it. Talking about your hair, your, mm -hmm. you know, the emphasis of your lips and your body, your curves, which is now people want to get surgery for it, but for so many years, we've been told that this is right. not what yep. the idea of, of beauty is. Mm -hmm. But I say all that to say like, we deal with these things day in and day out and we're so strong because we can handle it. Uh, and we don't have that guidance most of the time. Yeah. You know, we don't have somebody to confide in and it's men, black men especially, you're taught to bottle those things in and to be aggressive and it's okay to, you know what I mean? To kind of go about it, don't speak up on certain things. Mm -hmm. So then you sit there and you're lost and I'm 24, 25 years old. Like, what do I feel? Like, what is this? I don't want to call myself depressed. I don't want to say I have anxiety. Yeah. I don't want to label myself with these things, but I, I mean, they're coming, people are getting more comfortable speaking out about it. And it's like, well, what do I fall in these categories? And who do I, who can, who can I lean on? Yeah. So I think that, and then youth education, it shouldn't be, you know, when I was in school being, you, you see slavery and you're victimized. Mm -hmm. And then you look up years down the road and it's just like, this is who I know myself to be as a, uh, someone who's a nuisance. I'm someone who's in the way. I mm -hmm. should make other people feel safe and comfortable. And I mean, we should, we should, we should talk more in, in middle school and in high school about our history because it's US history. It's not, it's not just black history. Mm -hmm. So just like they uh, emphasize uh, Confederate leaders and other generals and presidents and so many other people throughout our history, black men and women need to be emphasized for our success and what we've done well, not just uh, the times of enslavement and yeah. you know the, on, that that only piece of history. Yes. Black history is so broad, <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. and we get <laughs> yeah. we get a quick summarized version. Yeah. It's like Martin there you go, King. and if you want to learn more, let's go to college and have African American studies to learn more about this. Yeah. What I need most is is allyship. Like love out loud. It's a big difference between claiming you don't hate somebody and actively loving somebody. Mm -hmm. Like if this room was infested by wasps all of a sudden, and you know, black folks, we can be hard, we can be dumb, <laughs> we can be whatever, but you see a wasp, you got out of here, right? right? There are wasps in this room. I equate the argument of, oh, I'm not a racist to, 
Oh man, them stings don't really hurt that bad. It wasn't that many in there. The media totally meant fake news. Mm -hmm. You're right. Anti-racism is, ooh, this going, I'm risking this thing, but I'm coming in there with some spray. I'm gonna make sure I eliminate as much as I have the power to. I can't solve it, I can't kill every wasp, I can't save every person from getting stung. But man, I can imagine that sting and how it feels. And I feel a little something in my body as I imagine what they're being subjected to in their body. And nah, I just can't, I can't go out like that. I can't be the one that didn't say or do anything. So I'm grabbing wasp spray and I'm going for it. Mm. And so that for me has been a, a powerful thing that's been really transformative for me is seeing that allyship. Um, follow up question for you. How do you feel when people look at athletes, separate them from their humanity and, and say things like, for example, shut up and dribble? Mm. Ooh. Man, uh, look, we're, we're educated. You know what I mean? We've taken the time to, to be vulnerable in a lot of different ways. When somebody looks at you and says shut up and dribble, you're demeaning the person is so much more that they are. That, that just shows me when you look at me, you only see an athlete. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have to start. We have to address that stigma. I'm a human being before anything else. Yeah. Um, until you take the time to get to know me, to know my passions and my interests, uh, you can't allow that to be, uh, you can't allow my profession to hinder everything else that I am in front of you. And that's yeah. especially as a black man, people see me and they assume, mm -hmm. right. immediately assume. My whole life I've had assumptions. The first day I stepped on campus, at UT, uh, what sport do you play? Mm -hmm. you know, I just bought my home right here in Houston. I'm like 10 minutes up the street. I'm downtown. It's in a nice area. And you have people look at you like they've never seen a black person in that, you know what I mean, in, the, in that position. So then it's like, okay, well, let me ask him, what does he do? And are you an athlete and things like that? Um, they don't know what I, what I do in my free time. They don't know my other interests. Uh, the fact that my faith is my number one asset and then I, I speak to the community and I do so many other things. So if I've taken the time to do that and to diversify my, my interest and my time, not only to entertain you, but to uplift people around me, you should take the time to stop and listen and to, right. and to say, what else are you doing? And how can I step away and detach from my profession and be available for people in my community? Um, as we wrap, when I was seven years old, I remember my dad trying to prepare me, not scare me, saying, hey man, I love you, so I'm gonna just tell you straight up. This was, this was his, his manner of teaching and I love him for it. Mm. Um, he was like, one day your day's gonna come, you're gonna get arrested for being black in America. Mm. And he looked me in my eye when he said it, with the kind of look he would look you in your eye with if he was gonna say something like, this is tragic and I don't know the answers and there's nothing we can do about it. And I was like, man, that's something kind of harsh to say to your seven-year-old son, right? And I uh, didn't know how to feel about it. Um, grew up in some diverse schools, and so I'm grateful for that. I had black friends, and I had white friends, and I had Latino friends, and I had um, friends of all kinds of upbringings. And then I remember, very similar to what Marcus was saying, in an apartment complex, I was at college. Um, I'm upstairs inside uh, the complex in, in my spot, unit number 704. Mm -hmm. And my roommate at the time, white guy, Troy, one of my best friends, I was his best man in his wedding. He still to this day is somebody I'm super close with. I'm like, man, I forgot my iPod in my car. I'm showing my age, not iPad, but iPod. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I leave 704, I go down the hall to the left, down the stairs, go to my car, to get my iPod out of my car. Mm. And police car rolls up. I'm waving at the officer, hey, how's it going? <laughs> I'm innocent. I have no reason to not trust police officers. And then I'm informed as the lights come on that I'm under suspicion of burglarizing vehicles. Same story as Marcus, you know, hoodie on. Don't believe that makes me a criminal. So I explain respectfully, this is my vehicle. I can hand you the key so you can open the door and see that my key opens this door. Would you like me to tell you the license plate numbers as I'm on the side of it, not looking at the front or the back? I'll do anything I need to do to just prove to you like this is my vehicle. I'm trying to be calm, speaking in a respectful tone. Next thing I know, two more cop cars come. So now there's three. Mm. I'm asked if I have ID. I explain that I live right up there. Didn't bring my ID with me. I was just gonna get my iPad out of my car. From there, 
head gets slammed against the hood of my car. Then I'm sat on the hood of a police car. Here's the handcuffs, lights coming on all over the complex, people looking out their window. Oh my goodness, what's happening? The fear, the embarrassment, the rage, the questions of like, should I be like resentful of these people? Mm. I've done nothing but be respectful, but here I am on display. In that moment, for the first time ever, the words that my father told me at age seven that I felt like were harsh, I was now accepting as wisdom. Mm. And this was that moment I was arrested for being black in America. And I'm grateful that I have a strong father. I'm grateful that he spoke with honesty, even if it was something that felt a little too heavy to receive in that moment, because it informed my decisions and how I communicated the rest of that night so that thankfully I was able to get back to number 704 that night. But I remember going back in because there was this whole detailed home search going down. No warrants, there'd be no reason for a warrant as I was an innocent person looking to get his iPod out of his car. And they're searching everything with flashlights and we're talking invasive search, cabinets flying open, backpacks being unzipped. And then finally they open a bedroom door mm -hmm. and my roommate Troy was sleeping. Uh, my roommate Troy, who is white, pops up awake because there's a flashlight in his face. And the defining moment of that night was it was that moment. Mm -hmm. That moment, somebody who looks like them sees them and instantly handcuffs off, no apology, no explanation, utter disappearance. Mm. Mm -hmm. And for me, I feel like when I see allyship, I feel so compelled to support it, to welcome it, to champion the cause of it, to speak to the value and the power it has. Um, that guy, Troy, was like, we need to talk about this. If that were me going to get your iPod for you, none of this would have happened to me. And that owning of it. I'm grateful for all you guys. I'm grateful for the role that you play in legacy, because I feel like this is a legacy moment. And I read this really incredible book that's called Legacy, and it speaks to that. And it basically says the jersey was printed up long before you were ever drafted. Mm -hmm. And that same jersey will be worn by that same team long after you retire. But in this moment, you're in this jersey. Leave the jersey better than you found it. Yeah. And I think about the name on the front of the jersey. And I think about the name on the back of the jersey. And it's like, I feel like Black America feels like the name on the front of the jersey is what people see. Do they see my name? Do they see my humanity, who I really am, my core motivations, my values, what I can bring to the table? Or do they just see Black, right? Mm -hmm. And so I want to just say I appreciate you guys for how you've worn the jersey tonight. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of reference to the past, what was printed up before you ever were brought into this. And there was a lot of hope expressed for the future and the type of victorious, triumphant future that we hope to see. But this was the moment. You were here, you were fully present, you were engaged. You are doing something in the life that you live right now to honor your father, so to speak, ancestors and the generations past, and to pour into your sons, so to speak, the generations to come. So I thank you, I honor you, and I appreciate you so much for being a part of this conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank y'all for real, man. This was like this Willie said, I'm so fed. <laughs> yeah. Man, so good. So, yeah. Man, appreciate y'all, man. Y'all like bless my soul. Man. Thank y'all so much. Like, so many good. great man. moments. Yeah. Powerful things that will stick with me. Yeah. Yeah. From all of you. Straight so. up. So much That's wisdom. It. Honor. It's a great group. <laughs> I'm inspired by all of you. <laughs>